Welcome to the last episode of the first season of Obscure Those Games. It's hardly the end, but the season is done and the next video will launch the second one. So let's dive in and see what's in the store today. The Cool Croc Twins is an unusual single-screen platformer for up to two players. The ultimate goal of the game is for one of the Crocodile Twins, Punk or Funk, to reach a beautiful Crocodile Girl, by Crocodile standards at least. So they compete through over 60 levels, scoring points, hoping to get to her. Well, if you play alone there's no competition really, but the game is still quite fun. Each level is built out of platforms surrounded by numerous bulbs that require lighting up. The mechanics are all based around reversing of gravity, so there's no jumping whatsoever, but you may reverse it to change the side you are standing on from the bottom to the top. And I know it sounds weird, but that's the best way of describing it. Because the gravity's pulling side doesn't have to be down or up. You can actually stand on the left side of the vertical platform with said left being the floor for you, just to switch the gravity and change the sides to the right. Honestly, looking at the face Batman is making now, I feel like I'm not explaining it best. It's probably good that there's video in the background, as it's worth a thousand words. Batman's not too bright when he hasn't had his coffee though, so perhaps I'm a bit too rough on him and should give him a little time. Anyway, walking on platforms when you get to the edge of them doesn't make you fall but cross to the other side, also switching the gravity for you automatically. To complete the level you have to lit up all the bulbs in it, and you do it by bumping them with your head Mario style. It has to be hit thrice to be completely lit. Some levels feature obstacles like stones that have to be removed to open up access to the bulbs, and you do so by also bunking them with your noggin. There are enemies that work collectively to reverse your progress by turning the bulbs off. They move using the same mechanics you do, so can access everywhere you can. If you play Cool Croc Twins using VGA, the game looks really nice and colorful, and all the sprites are smoothly animated and cute. EGA and CGA are not worth your time, so if that's your only choice, then the game is much better played on the Amiga, or even, believe it or not, C64. Arnie 2 aka Arnie Savage Combat Commando is an isometric action slash shooter with the main character's likeness everywhere other than the box cover based on Arnold Schwarzenegger. And it's a sequel to an earlier C64 and Amiga game, Arnie, that was a side-scrolling shooter platformer. A new isometric view made the presentation feel more modern, but in the same time introduced a whole set of new issues. The inability to move behind the objects for one, which is odd and feels out of place in a game where basically it looks as if you could hide behind every single thing on the screen. It can lead to a situation where you'll be backed into a corner thinking you've a way to escape, when in fact you'll effectively be blocked. The enemy IQ is also not great, though this can obviously be excused in a game where they serve in most cases as cannon fodder for our hero to plow through, at least there's quite a few of these. From simple infantry with rifles, through soldiers with rocket launchers, all the way to the tanks and helicopters. While you start with basic gun and a limited supply of grenades, some of defeated foes drop their more powerful weapons and other useful pickups like first aid kits and extra lives. Arnie 2 is not the best arcade game out there, but if you like the genre it's a decent one and can be quite fun for a single playthrough, especially that it's not very long and only features 4 main missions. Shutdown of a chemical plant by blowing up 15 pipeline valves, clearing an airfield of enemy units, infantry and mechanized, climbing from one battleship to another in a hostile harbor, and finally rescue operation where you have to save as many POWs from jungle camp as you manage. I'd like to add here that now it's the best time to play Arnie 2 given the recent release of Fubar on Netflix. Hold on a sec, my assistant seems to have something to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, got it, yep. All right, he asked me to tell you that he's Batman. Since we've already covered one game using image of 80s and 90s action hero today, why not tackle another? This time, however, the likeness is officially licensed and is not of a bodybuilder slash actor, but wrestler slash actor. There seems to be a lot of slashes here today. I gotta talk to my assistant, he seems to be leaving way too many of this in. He's probably drinking again. Ever since he stopped fighting crime in Gotham, he's been sleeping. Anyway, Suburban Commando is an action game based on the movie of the same title starring Hulk Hogan. While he was not a great actor, I could think of many worse, and he did wrote on the wave of his WWF popularity and milk that cash cow in the early 90s as much as he could. And good, cause that's what you do when you know your limitations and notice the peak that you're on. Apparently as Batman and I, we're still trailing the valleys with no peaks inside, so we can only theorize about it. So, 
Suburban Commando, the game, is an odd mixture. It's part horizontally scrolling space shooter, part platformer and part versus fighter, and it loosely follows the plot of the movie. In first level you're flying through space destroying enemy drone formations and collecting power-ups. It's viewed from a side perspective and plays similarly but not as good as RTEP or Project X. Then there are three consecutive platforming stages in which you have to find 9 items each. As you do that you'll fight many different enemies using two universally known wrestling attacks of punches and kicks while avoiding being shot. And finally after each of the missions you'll encounter a boss enemy who you'll be battling in a versus fighter mode. It's worth mentioning that while the first two game modes are not great, they are correctly realized and are actually fun. The versus fighting sections are terrible. Sure there's an attack or two more than in platforming, but they're spectacularly disappointing. And the whole segment feels like an afterthought added mid-development to spice up the gameplay, rather than something that was planned from day one. All in all, Suburban Commando is not bad, but it's not great either. Just is. Kinda like Batman after he retired. Nothing special about him, just a half-man half-bat working for a small YouTuber. Bad blood is what Batman and I have. Ever since I've noticed that he's been slacking off as my bat servant, I mean bat assistant obviously, and he's been making tons of bat mistakes. If he wasn't free I would have bat rid of him a long time ago. Oh my god, I think I'm reaching new heights of cringe. Anyway, Bad Blood is also a top-down action game with some light role-playing elements. After the nuclear war that devastated the world was long over and the debris and radiation in large parts fell down, uncovering the sun once more, humanity survived. But it was changed. Large cities were populated by the pure blood humans, while mutants lived in villages and small settlements, making a living hunting various irradiated creatures and monsters. Your village chief entrusted you with a mission of preventing the war between the factions, as one of the human leaders, so-called Lord Dominix, started forming a plan to eradicate all mutants once and for all. You start the game by picking a predefined character out of the available three, a strong mutant fighting with bare hands, a human male with knife, or a human mutant hybrid female that looks human but can shoot lasers out of her eyes. Cool. Which my assistant is saying reminds him of a budget Superman, another person he apparently had some beef with. Anyway, the setting of the game is really captivating, it's far of future on Earth and many of the technologies that we have now and take for granted are either long forgotten, lost or misspelled after decades last few were created. Uzis, for instance, so those automatic pistols that speed bullets faster than your mother-in-law can list your insecurities, is actually spelled double O, Z and double E, Uzi. There's plenty of these small touches in the game that may seem irrelevant at first but all put together create the atmosphere of green post-war post-tech society that is definitely on the downfall rather than on its way to rise again. Bad blood is real time and all its combat is action based too. That said it may require a bit of kiting at times as enemies are quite challenging. But if you master the hit and run technique, you'll soon forget that you're doing it all together. It won't change much throughout the game though, as the only way you can get better is by equipping more powerful weapons because there's virtually no character development in Bad Blood whatsoever. The game features day-night cycle and it influences the number of opponents on the screen and limits access to certain NPCs or areas. It's worth pointing out that completing the game features a very satisfying ending which was not always the case in the early 90s. Bumpy's arcade fantasy is an arcade puzzler unlike most. I mean the basic concept is very simple and even an average Batman would be able to grasp what it's all about. In short you play as a bouncing smiley face ball that has to collect all items on each level and then get to the exit. All levels are single screen only and feature various different platforming challenges, usually based on the number and kinds of platforms within. And there's surprisingly many. I mean I've not completed the game but there's a lot. There are standard ones that do nothing special, they're just there for you to jump on. Kinda like my assistant, Manbat or whatever his name is, he's nothing special and he's seemingly just there for the sake of being here, cause he sure as hell doesn't do his job. There are also trampoline platforms that allow for much higher bounces, movable platforms, teleport platforms that do what you'd expect them to based on the name only, pass through platforms that only allow of passing in one indicated on the direction, spiky platforms that you should not bounce on and bumpers that bounce you diagonally. And that all is just scratching the surface. The underlying mechanics and goal of each level is very simple. So that the Bumpy's Arcade Fantasy has a very low entry point and is a fun introduction to puzzle games for those who are not familiar with the genre. But don't get fooled, while the difficulty curve is very forgiving it does grow constantly, even if just by a little per each stage. Eventually you'll find yourself in a point where you need to start considering how to approach the level, plan your each next bounce. So while it's simple to get into, it's progressing in such a way that puzzle lovers of all skills will like it.
Not many people short of world's greatest detective know that Shadow of Y Serbius was actually originally an online-only game, a mod, so multi-user dungeon that ran on Sierra's own network. This Shadow of Y Serbius is an offline version of the same game. It is viewed from the first-person perspective and takes place in dungeons below the titular Volcano Y Serbius. The story advances along with your leveling up and progressing through the dungeon, which I must add features an auto-map system which is always fun in games like that. Shadow of White Sabres is not a game for everyone, it requires a very specific player, a person who either grew up on these older, simpler dungeon crawlers or likes progressing for the sake of getting better. A min-max player to whom the story and long conversations with branching paths are just a stopgap in enjoyment of the game. If you are such person, you'll have a great time playing White Serbius. If you're not, then this may actually be the game to stay away from. Why? Because it's very simple. There's hardly any NPCs and these that are there are relegated to role of hint-giving machines. Story unfolds slowly based on the character progression and not dialogue or choices that you make, and assembly line monster killing in hack and slash style is fun but doesn't feel to have much depth to it. You do it to get further, to get better, to carry on. Thing is, the biggest attraction of the original was the fact that you enjoyed it with others. You traversed the dungeons with friends or people you just met, and the need for the adventure is what connected you, what effectively made you a party exploring endless dungeons. Single player version does not offer that. And this is precisely why it's a game for a very specific kind of a gamer. I'm usually not one, but from time to time I do find myself hankering for some dungeon crawling without any overarching stories, plots, just to get that progression achievement rush. Wild West World is original 1990 Amiga release that dropped on PC a year later, and it's a really interesting one. It's a strategy slash management title that lets you run your own economic empire in the Wild West. And while it takes a little time to familiarize yourself with everything that's in the game, the time investment is worth it, as it rewards you with incredibly detailed simulation. Starting with the team that's unmistakably Western-like in its design, through graphics, sound and music. Everything fits perfectly. Even weather conditions are time and location appropriate, offering scorching summers with hurricanes, step fires and all that changes with the passing seasons. It feels real. As much as it was possible in 1991, that is. You'll be involved in anything and everything you can afford to bring even more money in. So you'll buy the land, establish farms, ranches and mines, you'll need to hire workers for all of this and make sure that they always have enough supplies of livestock, food and tools, and are paid on time. Wild West World can be played either by one or two players on the same system and it's obviously most fun against a buddy, or Batman, as he's whispering to me all throughout this game's running time to tell you just that. And that he's Batman. I really don't know why he's so keen on repeating who he is, but it is what it is. Shut up, Bruce, no one likes you. Can't you see that they don't care? Sorry guys, he's been very annoying ever since I mentioned him first. He seems to feel his newfound popularity will allow him to get back on the proverbial horse and restart his crime-fighting career once again somehow. Anyway, while the empire building and trading backbone of the game is very solid and most importantly fun, it's not what it's all about, as you don't really have to fight for the top dog spot clean and fair. In fact, you can act dirty just the way Wild West setting would expect you to. So, you can hire gangs of outlaws to harass your opponent's lands or even aim to try to eliminate them, you can bribe Indians to burn their estates and kill their workers, and all that is just scratching the surface. As long as you can afford it, you can be a mean Wild West magnate. And you know what? You should, because it's fun. And it will be a nice break from all the world saving that you usually do. Mirage Thunder is a fun, underrated, vertical scrolling shooter map, and I really don't get why. It's a quality game that could easily be on a cabinet in an arcade somewhere, sitting in a remote gas station or in a dark corner of your local chicken joint, where no one sits unless other seats are already taken, and it would rack up some serious coins in either. It has great for the time and platform graphics and sound, the music tracks are not overly annoying, even if a bit repetitive, but most of all it plays great. It's fast and frantic, full of very distinct and innovative enemies that can range from various machines and ships, through insect-like aliens of various kinds to hybrids of the two. Not really machines yet, but not fully biological beings either. Bosses are really fun too, and there's a lot of them, often few per stage. They're all entirely different not only in terms of how they look, no sprite swaps here whatsoever, but also how they act and in terms of tactics that you need to use to defeat them. And it's a blast figuring it out. There's quite a few different weapons to choose too, they're all upgradable and allow you to pick your faith to best suit your game style. You can unlock the satellite ships that follow you and help, and missiles. Mirage Thunder's graphics are excellent, crisp and smooth, often using very large sprites, even up to a quarter of the screen in size. 
parallax scrolling while sparse and only ever occurring here and there is quite nice and adds to the overall presentation too. Honestly, Mirage Thunder has been a surprise for me as I somehow overlooked it back in the day and it looks hella tasty. If you enjoy shooters, this one's a sweet sweet treat. But if you're more into savory things, then it's a spicy salty heaven that just melts on your screen. Come to think of it, some stages actually kinda look like it. Anyway, what I was failing to say here was, give it a go. I know that this video is called Best Obscure Those Games You've Never Heard Of, but Interactive Girls Vida X is definitely not the best at anything. Well, cringe perhaps, but that's debatable. That said, for some, it may be so incredibly bad that it actually becomes good. So on that notion, I've elected to talk about it anyway. Oh, and despite the subject, don't worry, no not safe for work content will be shown here. Although I gotta say that when I mentioned that I'll be covering this one, it was probably the only time in the last two weeks that I saw Batman put away a bag of chips and acting genuinely interested. But the little perv he is, he will not get to see anything obscene here today. Anyway, Interactive Girls or VideX or whatever it's really called is generally speaking a point and click adventure game that substituted interesting and involving puzzles, unique locales and characters to meet with digitized still images of ladies. Or a lady in this particular case, cause there were supposed to be more of these games in the series and as far as I know only two ever came out. But whatever, we're talking about VidaX today. Story of VidaX is so shallow it's like a dried up puddle. There's this lady whose name I've mentioned probably 50 times already and she's for better or worse interested in you. And what your ultimate goal is, is to take her home with you and sweep her off her feet. I mean not in a creepy pervy way, yeah I'm looking at you Bruce, but woo her with your personality so that she would eventually agree to make sweet sweet love to you. And it's so simple it's hard to call it a game really. More like a mouse click simulator. For one, you cannot make the wrong choice here when talking to Vida. I mean you can, but the game will just tell you what your mistake was and revert you back to the point where you've made it, so that you could pick something else. You can literally complete this whole affair, pun intended, in 20-30 minutes and be done with it. It's not great guys, but it has to be seen to be believed how cringe a game can become and still act as if it was a serious product. What were the devs thinking? Well, they either went for the aforementioned so but it's good vibe or just wanted to get the sales on a pure foundation of potential buyer's horniness. So, approach VDX only as a novelty and don't expect to invest any real time in it. As Overkill itself says just before the title screen when you launch it, it's not a shareware game. And honestly, it doesn't look like one, but since it was released by Epic Mega Games, then Masters of the Shareware, I kinda get the sentiment of why it had to be included in the game, so that people would not share it without paying. But people will do what they will do, so there's that. No message could prevent it. Anyway, Overkill is a vertically scrolling shoot em up and it may very well be the best DOS EGA shooter. The jury is still out on that. Sure, there were better VGA games, but for EGA, it's hard to find one. Especially that the colors are so smartly used and mixed in a way that I'm sure you wouldn't have noticed that it's EGA if I haven't told you. Oh well, even if I'm wrong, I can tell you that Batman dropped a candy bar and spilled his soda when he heard that it was not VGA. So, we've established that the graphics are great for the hardware, but what about the sound design? Well, the MIDI music is pretty decent and appropriately actiony for the lack of a better word, it just fits. Sound, however, is a hot mess. It only works with PC speaker and while there were some rare occasions when people were able to squeeze something semi-decent from it, overkill is not the case. All the beeps and boops are annoying and it's sad but there was no attention put towards Sound Blaster support that by 1993 was widely available. Story-wise, you come back home after long being away and realize that your planet is no more, destroyed by an evil alien race. Well, it's too late for it, it's not for the universe itself, so you, being the galactic badass that you are, decide to single-handedly, like a proper late 80s superhero, read the space of the Scourge. You head out to attack and destroy all six of evil aliens' planets and eventually their battle star, which is what Death Star was supposed to be but the aliens have run out of advertising budget and the name was conceived internally without help of external dedicated ad agencies. A mistake on their side, but not the worst one. Worst was pissing you off. There's quite a few weapons available in Overkill and they're upgraded by adding satellite mini ships to your fighter, and you can have even up to 6 of these. So the variety is definitely there. And if you like shooters, you will love this fast and believe it or not, fairly balanced game. It's not too tough, not too easy, it's just perfect. So, this is the last episode in the series for this first season. The next one will launch the second. How did you find today's 10 games? Any you knew of? Did something surprise you among the choices? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. If you didn't, well, then there's thumbs down there too. But I suppose you wouldn't have persevered up to this point if you really didn't. Around 60% of you are not subscribed and there's currently no way of knowing if YouTube will decide to recommend you the next episode or not. 
other than subscribing and hitting the bell that is. And that bell is amazing, as whenever the new video is out, YouTube will actually send you small and friendly notification about it so you wouldn't miss it. If you'd like to support the channel, Patreon and YouTube memberships are a great way of doing so. They will help me release better content and members also get first dips on all new videos before they're publicly accessible on YouTube. If you can't or don't want to do that though, likes and subscribes are great too. I would like to take a moment here and thank all the YouTube creators from whose videos short bits were taken to serve as a background to my commentary. They're all amazing and stars among the retro community and deserve your subscription. They all have mine. You'll find names of the channels at the top of the screen when their footage is running and also in the video description below. For me though, this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next time. Peace.